Hi everyone, I'm Caitlin Spadavecchia, a Duquesne student, and I worked with Dr. Krokobolos on this optics theory project. The title of my presentation is Projective Geometric Algebra for Paraxial Geometric Optics. Definitely a mouthful, but hopefully by the end, it'll be clear that projective geometry is a simpler and more natural math description for paraxial geometric optics than older techniques. To begin with, I want to explain a little bit about geometric algebra, since it's going to be useful for our project. Geometric algebra, or GA, is an extension of linear algebra and can be used to unify, simplify, and generalize many areas of math, including Euclidean, non-Euclidean, and projective geometries, which I'll get into a little bit later. To get into some of the details, we are working in the two-dimensional vector space with two perpendicular basis vectors, E1 and E2, and one bivector, which is an area with orientation. So unlike standard vector analysis, where primitives represent points and directions only, in GA, there are additional primitives representing lines, areas, and volumes, and can be extended to any higher dimension by the same token. So with more geometric primitives, more can be generalized and simplified by geometric algebra. Below, there are some important operations of GA, including the inner product, outer product, and geometric product. In this example, there are two vectors, u and v. The inner product takes two vectors and returns a scalar, just like the more familiar dot product, and the only difference is that it can be applied to any higher dimensional primitive. The outer product takes two vectors and returns a bivector, but can also be applied to bigger objects. The cross product is a special case of this. The third is the geometric product, which is the fundamental operation of GA for good reason. The geometric product includes both the inner and outer product and returns both the scalar and bivector at the same time, which is what makes it so new and so weird. Together, these two measures capture information that is not present in just the inner or outer product alone. Next, I want to introduce the topic of projective geometry. Projective geometry has its origins in early Italian Renaissance and can be seen in many architectural drawings and paintings as projections of lines and points onto planes. Think about this drawing, for example. It maps out a three-dimensional space on a two-dimensional space by using the rules of projective geometry, what we probably know better as perspective. We are using the dual representation of projective geometric algebra, or PGA for short, in two dimensions. And this is what the notation on the top right represents. One thing you might see here is that PGA includes another basis element, E0, along with E1 and E2. Before I said that E1 and E2 were perpendicular, and in these figures it definitely doesn't look to be so. Be mindful that this is a perspective drawing where E0 is the added horizon, and E1 and E2 are still perpendicular, it just doesn't look to be. You may see this more clearly in the orange arrows I've drawn on top of this drawing. There are two operations I've included here, although not completely new. The outer product that you all saw before is what's called the meet operator, because its new geometric interpretation in PGA is used to find the intersection of two lines, and where they meet is a point. The join operator is the dual of the meet, so basically the same thing but backwards, taking two points and joining them to form a line. Since we're using the dual representation of PGA, vectors are lines and bivectors are points, and you can see this in this figure here. Look at the lines E2 and E0 on the left. On the right, I use the meet operator for lines E2 and E0 to find the point E20. Similarly, you can use the join operator on points E20 and E01, which is what I've shown on the left. And of course, you get the line E0. On this slide, I just wanted to show how to write lines and points in two-dimensional PGA, as it'll become useful when I show an example. One thing you might notice are the extra ones that hang out at the back of both equations. This is because they follow what is called homogeneous coordinates, where the one is the added projective plane. Points and lines are defined only up to an arbitrary scalar factor, meaning if we multiply all of the elements in either of these equations by the same number, we get the same geometric object. Before we get into our example, I think it'll be helpful for you to understand why we use paraxial geometric optics. Paraxial optics uses some approximations to make calculations more clear. It is valid for points and rays that stay near the axis of the system. The first approximation I want to mention is a small angle approximation, which mandates that all light rays enter nearly parallel to the optical axis and much smaller than one radian. The next is that all surfaces in the path of the light ray are flat in the sense that their radius of curvature is much larger than any of the vertical distances in the problem. The last is that we're using rays and not waves, so no diffraction occurs. Here's a concrete example of calculating the path of rays through a thin lens. Point P is an arbitrarily chosen point, and from it I made a ray and gave, a, gave it a slope of 0.05 meters, since we know it has to be small. Also, I made the focal length F to be 0.5 meters. We then have to calculate how the ray transforms due to the lens, and here's one way to do that. 
On the top left is the matrix equation with the ray transfer matrix for a thin lens. Both B values are the heights from the axis to where the, the ray intersects the lens. These values should be exactly the same since there's no horizontal distance in the thin lens, but not the same for something like a thick lens. So this matrix equation takes the initial height and slope at the lens and transforms it according to the lens. The ray that corresponds to the point I've picked here has height B and slope M, which I've written here in orange. Below are my solutions, both with the traditional ray transfer matrix and the version for homogeneous coordinates. What's important to notice is that the outgoing rays for both methods are exactly the same. Well, that's great, but the negative one didn't do anything here. Let's take the same problem and reimagine it like so. Here's what I did. I defined three points, point P, point O, the origin, and point Y, a point above the origin, and I converted them into points in PGA. Next, I joined points P and O to make ray R, and I joined P and Y to form ray S. As you can see, my solutions are boxed here. The next step is calculating outgoing rays R prime and S prime. We can use some tricks here. The first is that any ray going through the center of a lens does not refract, so R prime equals R. The second trick is that we know any ray that is parallel to the axis must go through the back focal point. So we can calculate ray S prime by joining point Y and the focal point, point F. The final step is calculating the image point by using the meet operator to find the intersection between rays R prime and S prime. Now think about how much more difficult this problem would be just with algebra. Luckily for you, I've shown how to do this on the bottom half of this slide. First, I use point slope form to find ray R, which we know is also R prime. Next, since we know that ray S is parallel to the axis and exits through the back focal point, we know the slope is negative B over F and its height is 0 0.1. So there we get ray S prime. I set them equal to one another and I solve for the intersection. Instead of solving any equations, PGA allows us to use simple multiplication operators to intersect lines and join points. Well, this is even more great, but we found a better way, and we did it by using the outer morphism property of geometric algebra. So let me explain what this is about. We have what is called the linear operator, and this transforms vectors linearly, so preserving scalar multiplication and addition. The outer morphism of a linear operator extends this from vectors to any other type of primitive, so area, volume, whatever. Here's an example for the same thin lens problem, but this time using a point instead of a ray. On the left, we are extending the ray transfer matrix M to the bivector basis by applying the outer morphism property to each of the three basis bivectors. The results can be represented as the columns of the matrix MB in the bivector basis. The bivector version of any ray transfer matrix comes out this way. And that's exactly what I did here for the thin lens ray transfer matrix. I just reordered it so that the elements matched up. And once again, we got the same answers, but only had to do one matrix multiplication rather than calculating two rays and solving for their intersection. So basically, we turned an object point into an image point directly by using one matrix multiplication. And the applications don't just stop at a thin lens. Since we are using paraxial geometric optics, all optical behaviors can be approximated by linear operators, and we've discovered that this makes it really easy to transform any geometric primitive point line area through any optical system. In the future, we want to expand to using conformal geometric algebra, which includes more geometric primitives, circles and spheres. With this, we speculate that we'll be able to use fewer approximations in the optical system. We also speculate that there might be a connection between ray and wave optics, as the ABCD matrices that we used here are also used to describe the propagation of a laser beam in the complex beam parameter. Here are some really cool and useful resources to those who might be interested. Also, a big thanks to the Bear School for funding this research. Thank you!